Well, as we're working our way through Ephesians chapter 1, we come to a very powerful phrase at the end of verse 7. According to the riches of his grace. And then we go on in to verse 8. Which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. According to the riches of his grace. We saw there earlier, it was through the redemption of his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And the forgiveness of sins is by the riches of his grace. You know this. God will forgive you of every sin, right? You have sinned this past week, no doubt. I think we're all reasonably confident as much as we don't want to sin. We are going to sin in the future. And of course, if you say, man, I'm doing pretty good, well, compare your life of obedience to that of Jesus. And we quickly see that our righteousness, at its best, is still filthy rags compared to the righteousness of Christ. So I'm so glad we are not saved by our righteousness. I'm so glad we are saved by the riches of his grace. And so we know it's not any sin that won't be forgiven by Christ for he has already paid for all the sins of all people of all times upon the cross from the very first sin of Adam and Eve to the last sin committed no doubt in the millennial reign and every sin in between they have all been paid for 100%. So when we come into that throne of grace and ask for grace and mercy to help us in our time of need, which is about every 10 minutes for me, I can come boldly because I know of the riches of his grace. Whatever the sound, whatever the sin, however it might abound, his grace, what? Abounds more. There's no sin that Christ is unwilling to forgive right now. There's no depth of the horribleness of your sin. There's no numerous amount of sins. There's no combination of sins put together into a big bundle that look, you know, horrible, worse than it could ever be, that Christ won't forgive. Do you know that, right? Guess what? We are living in a non-Christian country now. Whatever their warped view about Christianity is, it's not that. The Judeo-Christian ethic, they see us as a bunch of Puritans or Pharisees. A bunch of righteous, self-righteous people coming to church, praising our glory and our goodness and, and our ability to keep being religious in the midst of a world that clearly has no God in it. But we're all a bunch of little children wanting to believe in fairy tales. They used to just ignore us, but now they don't want us to exist. Does your neighbor know that Christ will forgive him of all sin? I say he probably doesn't. What if you were to go and write a note 
and simply say, Christ will forgive you for all your sins. I would like to tell you more and write your name, your phone number. What do you think would happen? You see, the Holy Spirit is in the world right now. It tells us in John 16, calling men unto sin and righteousness and judgment. There's a great conviction of the Holy Spirit calling men to himself and letting them know they are sinners. So you don't have to convince them of that. The Holy Spirit is already revealing that to them. He's also showing them the other side of the coin that they have to attain to a perfect righteousness that man never can attain to. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Expiration date. You have to ask Christ forgiveness while you live. Because after death, in that holding place of Hades and Sheol, the holding for the wicked before the day of the great white throne judgment. All are believers there. And one day, every knee shall bow, whether those in Hades, those upon the earth that have not believed, and of course, those in heaven with the Lord for sure. Everyone at one moment in time will bow and declare Jesus as Lord. But for those who have died, it will be too late. Their confession, their faith, it will not help them. For a man must believe why he's yet alive. How will men believe if they don't hear? And how will they hear if somebody doesn't tell them? Well, that's what I'm betting on. Somebody's going to tell him. Yeah, the Jehovah Witness is knocking. The Mormons are knocking. Satan got his evangelist working overtime. These lying religions that put people into worse bondage than their own sin. They are ever so diligent to take that prompting of God upon their heart and lead them, as Jesus said, to be sons of hell. And those who lead them there are twice the sons of hell. And so we know of these riches of his grace, the redemption, the forgiveness that comes according to the measure of this riches of his grace. It's not a small redemption. The forgiveness that was won for us through Jesus was on a cross. The price that the Father in giving his only begotten Son, the price of the Son going through it. Father, if there's any way for this cup to pass, there is no other way under heaven in which men can be saved. This is why that final conversation with the Son and the Father happened. To let us know as Jesus bled out the pores of his sweat glands in the sweat. There is no other way, son. Jesus, for the joy set before him, paid that price. And the price that Christ paid for your forgiveness was an expensive price. So never let us say we're just forgiven. No, we are given, we are forgiven by the riches of his grace. He became poor that we might become rich. Rich in what? Rich in grace. Rich in forgiveness. When we are forgiven, it's just not some clerical work some angel does in heaven and files it away. 
The forgiveness takes away the guilt of our sin. It takes away the shame of our sin. It takes away the stain of our sin. Does it not? Christ makes us as white as snow. God's greatest achievement is man's greatest need. And that is the forgiveness of sins. And he made this to abound towards us. I love the way the ESV translates this. It says, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. He lavished it. Would you like some whipped cream on that pie? Lavishly. (laughs) We don't use that word enough, do we? Lavish it on there. The dictionary defines this word abound or lavished. Bestow something in generous, extravagant quantities. To cover something thickly or liberally. To expend or give in great amounts, I love this part, without limits. Is this not our salvation? He's lavished it upon us in all wisdom and prudence, or I like it, insight. He gives us the the wisdom. The word here is a very generic term. The, The wisdom of God's nature. Has God not revealed to us that he is the prodigal son's father? We've all, in our journey as Christians, have been the prodigal. We, I feel like I'm a prodigal every day. But yet I also know he's going to be outside the city. Before anybody sees him, he's not, he doesn't want him to gossip around town about being the pig boy. Or coming back so ravished and tattered by the world. Before news gets around this city, he already has a new robe. He already has a ring. He already has sandals. Rather than looking like the poor beggar boy that he was, beaten up by the world, he looked as great as the day he left. That's the grace of God, isn't it? That's who we know as God, our Father, And know of the nature of our God. And then he wants to give us insight into that wisdom. So putting all things together here. God doesn't want us to just be forgiven. He wants us to have a deep, vast understanding of the riches of his grace. To understand the depths of his forgiveness. And then he wants us to keep abounding in that wisdom and knowledge. So we keep explaining it in a different, more thick, deeper way every time to understand. We've seen thus far in this book of Ephesians, the wisdom and this insight into this forgiveness and this grace that we have. He's told us that we were chosen, that we are the elect of God. In John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, ordained you, that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, and whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Wow. I've chosen you to bear much fruit and to have a power with the Father, the same power in prayer that I have. In John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and no one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. John 6, 39 and 40, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day. This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. 
and I will raise him up on the last day. John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Peter, in 1 Peter 2, 9, we are a chosen generation. We're a generation of the elect, a royal priesthood. Do you remember David and all those psalms wanting to be a priest? I would give up being a king in a second just to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. I'd give up all my royalty just to be a sparrow in a nest so I could be in the presence of God all the time. Uzziah wanted so bad to be a priest, he took the censer and was going to go act like a priest. And God stopped him in his place with leprosy. We can. We are kings, but we are also priests. We are a holy nation, his own special people that proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. We are a chosen, elect people. The moment we say, yes, I want forgiveness of sins, and I believe that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that I would not perish because of my sins, but have everlasting life. The moment we open that door that the Lord was knocking on, the Holy Spirit's convicting us of sin, righteousness, judgment. The Holy Spirit ahead of time's given us a measure of faith that we might believe. We open that door, we walk in, we turn around and say, hi, Brian, I've known about this from the foundations of the world. We realize that this is no accident, that this is not by my power of insight. This isn't by me being more humble than the average man and willing to confess that I'm a sinner. No special humility, no special insight. It was all the powerful work of God that he knew about before time began. And then we also learn of his plan for us. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Paul talks about this in Romans 8, where our heart continually condemns us. Satan condemns us, men condemn us, but nobody condemns us better than ourselves. And he says, none of that condemnation sticks. Because God has given his son. And if God gave you the son, his son, to pay for your sins, to die on the cross, to raise again for you, why would he now stop having mercy and grace upon you? He's already given everything. So whatever he gives you now is lesser than what he's already given you. So why would he be willing to give you something great, but unwilling to give you something small? giving us forgiveness through the death and the torture and the blood and the, the crucifixion of Christ. Now all you're doing is saying, forgive me for that anger, lie, bitterness, lust, greed. He's already paid for it in the cross. The greatest work has already been done. This is, this is little tiny pennies compared to the gazillions he already gave, right? Right? In Ephesians 2.10, a verse we're going to get to, we are his workmanship, poema, work of art, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand, predestined ahead of time, that we should walk in them. Do you realize this, guys? Every single day you wake up, God has predestined good works for you, for his kingdom that you can walk in. So in essence, we're saying, Lord, here I am. This is the day you've made. I want to rejoice and be glad in it. For myself, I just roll out of bed on my knees as much as I can and just say, God, please, today, let me say all, be all, love all, speak all that you have for me, lacking nothing. 
Because today is a plan that you have laid before time began. And I am your king. I am your priest. I'm a light into the world, a salt into the earth. How lovely are those feet that, upon the mountains that go to spread the good news. Let me be the light, the salt of the earth that you have made me to be. What else have we learned in this wisdom and this intelligence, this prudence, this insight that he's keeping our salvation? He make, he's making it sure, unchangeable, that the salvation God gave us is like his very nature. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In 1 Peter 1, verse 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance, listen to this, incorruptible. Are you afraid you're corrupting your salvation? God gave me such a great salvation, but I'm corrupting it. No. No. It's incorruptible by any demon, by any angel, by any man, not by yourself, definitely not by God. This salvation, this inheritance is incorruptible, undefiled. Brian, looking at me, you think I'm probably a pretty holy guy. But man, you don't know how dark my brain gets. You don't know how bad I sinned this last week. I haven't sinned like this in 40 years. I defiled the salvation. I feel like I've lost it. I feel like God is saying I spit on him and, and I trampled on the cross and I'm no longer worthy of eternal life. Well, I'm glad God doesn't give us that kind of power, does he? This is his salvation. This is his righteousness. It's his gift that he's given to you. It's incorruptible. It's not possible to be defiled. It does not fade away. See, that's the thing. I should have died right after I got born again. I remember that night. It was a Sunday night. It was a warm summer evening and a friend invited me to church and they had this evangelist there and, and man, my heart was so full of joy and gladness and, and, I, and I, for a week I just walked around on the clouds having been born again. But that was some decades ago. In all the years since the tent days of Calvary Chapel, if I had a nickel for everybody who said, I used to go to church in that tent, One, there was about two billion people there. <laughs> but everybody wants to say, man, when, when things were moving in that Jesus movement, guess what? It hasn't faded away. It's simply if we will seek the Lord as we sought the Lord back then. If my people will humble themselves and pray, I'll hear from heaven and I will heal the land exactly the way I healed all of those young hippies. I'll heal all those Antifa people, all those BLM communist people. I'll heal the Democratic Party. I don't have that much faith, do you? Okay, some of the Democratic Party. Uh, sort of gives you an idea where we're all at polit politically. Nobody stormed out. <laughs> oh. But uh, here's the facts. Is that it's incorruptible. It's undefiled. It doesn't fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you. Listen to verse 5 of 1 Peter 1. Kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in time past. You had faith at one point in your time to believe Jesus to be your Savior. 
and Jesus received you unto himself. And he's hanging on to that. I hope that you're not a prodigal still stuck in the pig pen. I hope you're a prodigal that's on his way home or already got home. But God's every day waiting for your return. In John 10, 28 to 29, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all that no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Now, why did Jesus say this? Is it so theologians can take them to their seminaries and parse and discuss them in theological circles and write them down in their doctrine books or theological books on atonement or whatever? Or did God speak this and write this for everyday guys who feel like, I know the, for everybody else, God's kept their salvation for the power of God, but they're not sinners like me. I'm the exception to the rule. I'm the biggest sinner that's ever lived. I'm the weakest Christian that's ever been in church history. That's why you don't understand, Brian. Even though God elected me before the foundations of the world, even though God has this plan for my life that he planned before time began, yes, even though God's nature is to be faithful, even when I'm not faithful, yes, even though God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, it hasn't happened very often. There's only a, a few of us, but it's, I'm one of them guys that even though I've been saved by grace, I will perish. God did let me go because I am horrible. Do, do you understand we all think that? When I sometimes speak at high school groups and you have this group of high schoolers that have been raised in the church, I'll, I'll ask them sometimes a question. How many of you have thought the thought, maybe I am the Antichrist? They all chuckle, but they all lift their hands. You're the Judas. Ah because we, we are getting clued in to how wicked we really are. We really are the most sinful person we know. <laughs> but this is why Jesus is saying this. You've come to me. You're never going to perish. You've come to me. You, I got you in my hand. If you have little kids and you're walking on... In busy streets, do you let the little five-year-old hold your hand? There's no way. You hold their hand. See a penny out in the middle of the street and let you go, and whoosh, they run. You can't do anything about it. Jesus is saying this. Matthew 28, 20, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age and everything in between. Think about this. He says we are redeemed. That is the word for somebody to pay a price to buy a slave out of slavery. So Christ is now going to say, you know, I know you've been free for these past 10 years as not a slave anymore, but I'm going to have to turn you back into a slave because you haven't lived where... I'm going to try to get my money back. Now, now did, how did Christ buy us out of slavery? With gold or silver? Or some other corruptible thing on this earth? What was the price Christ paid to get us out of our slavery? Was it not his own precious blood? What's he going to do? Go try to get his blood back? And put you back in slavery? Do you, do you understand? This is, this is irrevocable. This gift, this calling, it's irrevocable. He says we are born again. Now, if you've read the Gospels, Jesus kept, keeps saying, if you understand how things work on the earth, you'll understand the spiritual principle because the same guy made them both. 
in everything you see, whether it's farming, placing seeds, or whether it's a family, a love towards a father and a child, whether it's a shepherd with sheep, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, what you're observing in the physical realm, it's a perfect parallel to what's happening in the spiritual realm. This is, this is one thing I point out when I'm talking to people in cults. I just simply explain. It's not consistent with the God of nature or nature's God, as our forefathers of our country said. That they made our constitution in the thoughts that it needs to be consistent with the nature of God and the God of nature. So if you're a Muslim and you're required to carry a blanket around with you, and at certain times during the day, no matter what's going on, you got to pull that blanket out and face east and start praying for an hour. Does that really work? It doesn't. You just go right down and look at every cult. It doesn't work in society. It doesn't blend. How are we to pray without ceasing? That's an extraordinary prayer life. But yet, there's no place, there's no time that we just can't cry out to God. We don't have to be in a building lighting candles. We don't have to go into a room with a priest to confess our sins. We can just simply call unto the Lord anytime, anywhere. But he says, coming into salvation is the same as a baby being born. 100% of all of us were born into this world, except for you extraterrestrials that are amongst us, but we can't, we can't tell. We've all been 100% born into this world. 100% of people going to heaven are born into that world. So once you're born into this world, you're alive. You can't go back into your mother's womb. You can't go back and get unborn. Nobody can get unborn. Nobody can climb back into their mother's womb and reverse the process. In the same way into this spiritual world, when we're born again, we're born, we're here. We can't stop being here. So when we are born again, we're into this spiritual world that God has created and God has given us as his inheritance. It's, it's by definition, irrevocable, undoable. Once you're born again, you are now into this spiritual world. We're going to learn in verse 13 of Ephesians 1, about being sealed. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. It tells us about in Ephesians 1.13. It's going to talk about in Ephesians 4.30, Romans 4.11, 2 Corinthians 1.22. And, and it makes it clear that Christ puts his Holy Spirit into us and it's like a signet ring of a king. When he stamps it on something, he owns it permanently. It's his. In Romans, it uses the word guaranteed. We are saved by faith as a gift. He says that our salvation is guaranteed. It's the same word, sealed. It's a done deal. Christ has bought us and he's not unbuying us. He has sealed us into his family as his kids. He adopted us. And he's not taking us back to the orphanage. I, I've never heard of somebody adopting a child, having them for a couple of years, and then taking them back to the orphanage saying, give me the paperwork to get this kid back to you. No, once you adopt them, there is no paperwork to unadopt them. We are redeemed by his blood out of slavery, unchangeable. We're born again, we can't not, not be born again. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The down payment, the layaway plan. 
his mark of ownership, protection, that it's the king's. We also learn that we have been predestined. This is in advance. He speaks of our, from our beginning to our end. He's already seen into the future, us seated together with him in heavenly places. He tells us he's already seen us in our brand new bodies, setting with him at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places. This is what Romans 8, 28 to 30 tells us. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now that we're his child, everything is going to be used by God to our furtherance. Whatever Satan throws at us, whatever we throw at ourselves, what another man throws at us, no weapons formed against us shall prosper. Amen? Boy, that weapon that guy had used to be my best friend, and now I don't talk to him. That weapon, man, it really stabbed me deep. But God's going to turn around for good. It's not going to make you bitter. It's not going to keep you from the love of Christ. It's a weapon formed against you, but it shall not prosper. All things work together for good because we are the elect. We are the called. We are the predestined ones. He already knew about it in advance, and he's already using that as one of the good works. He's turning around for his glory. He goes on in Romans 8, 29, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Do you see this, guys? He's already completed the action of making us into the image of his son. Do you realize this? When we stand in heaven, we are going to look just like Jesus in righteousness. First John 3 says, little children, I don't know what we're going to be, but I know that when I see him, we will be just like him. And whoever gets their eyes on the things above right now and realizes that, will live on this earth purifying themselves even as he is pure. Why is that? Because we're walking in faith. We're not walking in emotion. First John says, little children, when your heart condemns you, but God's greater than your heart. Yes, of course our heart condemns us. We're in human flesh. We're always thinking about how men throw away men. How children will quit talking to their parents. How one spouse will divorce another spouse. How one best friend will never talk to a guy again. Yes, we as humans do great damage to one another. And when we look at the past and years and decades go by, we look at that situation differently, differently, differently. And, and we realize it wasn't just that one person I broke relationship, but there's that person and that person and that situation and that situation. It's me. I have the ability to cause people to want to cut me off. I have the ability to cause people to not like me. I have the ability to, when I try to help the most, I still hurt, I still do damage. Yeah, that's every human being on this earth. That's us. That's our sinful flesh. Yes, I know about it too. I hate it too. But Christ says, the moment you realize you're the elect, look and see that you're seated together with him in heavenly places. Look just a little before that, We've been changed out of this body into our new body. And now that we're in our new body, we're walking in the same image as the Son in perfect righteousness. When we're out of this flesh, we will walk in the light as He is in the light, and we will have fellowship with one another. Until that day comes, we are just constantly in a humble heart of repentance every day. I'm not trying to repent to get God to like me. I'm not repenting because I don't want to lose my salvation. 
I'm not repenting so God doesn't throw me away. I just simply acknowledge every day this sinful flesh is once again keeping me from walking in righteousness, in joy, in peace, in the Holy Spirit. Daily I find as I repent, I got to come into that throne of grace boldly because faith explains to me my salvation is kept by the power of God. It's incorruptible. It's undefiable. It can't fade away. In John 17, all right, verse 30, excuse me, Romans verse 30. Moreover, who is predestined, those he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, whom he justified, these he's glorified. That's us in heaven. John 17, 20. I do not pray for these alone, but I also pray for those who believe in me through their word. Jesus is praying for us 2,000 years before we exist. Do you see this? That's Jesus praying for you. <laughs> A few days before he was crucified. And then in Hebrews 7, verse 25, therefore he also is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Revelation 5, right before we see ourselves singing in the throng of every tongue of nation and people, God's burning up the incense of the prayers of his saints. God's prayed for us before we ever existed. God is praying for us while we are on this earth and all the way through to the uttermost. He is saved to the uttermost. How is he saving us to the uttermost? By making intercessions for us. Philippians 1.6, being confident in this very thing, he who began the good work in you will completed until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Does your neighbor know that? You know, I think most people that know about Christianity don't know they're predestined. They don't know they're elect. They don't know that God's keeping their salvation by the power of God. They may be wandering around because they're in ignorance thinking that they've already messed up their Christianity. They've already destroyed, or maybe they've been to church for years and every week was condemning them for not praying enough and being holy enough and giving enough and serving enough and how we need to go spread the knowledge of him in every place. Paul is an example of this. You see, Paul's writing this letter not as a guy who has arrived and doing everything perfectly, he knows about this grace and all wisdom and intelligence because he himself needed it. Paul was in his pilgrimage, just like you and me, in our pilgrimage. There is a point, he tells us in Romans 7, the things I don't want to do, I'm doing. The things I do want to do, I don't do. I'm feeling condemned. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling like I should just give up. I feel like I'm, I should just walk away from Christianity because I'm giving it a black eye. Oh, wretched man that I am, Paul says. He's not just giving a theological statement here. He's saying, in my life, I have learned. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 12, he said, there's this thorn in my flesh. Satanic, and it's destroying me. And, and I feel like I have no ability to, to even get out of bed, to even take a step. I'm destroyed. And I told God, I'm destroyed. My flesh, in my flesh, I have no ability to take one more step. In 2 Corinthians 9, he says, guys, I, I, I'm having a fight right now. I'm having a fight like I've never fought. And I'm afraid unless I get disqualified, referring to his ministry. Apostle Paul get disqualified from being an apostle? Yes. I love this guy, Paul. He's just like me. But what did he learn? What wisdom and knowledge did he come to understand in the riches of God's grace? 
In 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, he said, For he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Wow. Therefore, most godly, I'd rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs. Oh, do I have needs. In persecutions, in distresses. Is sinning distressful? Is dealing with this human flesh distressful? All these distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. In Romans 5.20, do you think Paul just wrote this for other people? Or did he write it because he learned it himself, for himself? In Romans 5.20, for where sin abounded, what? Grace abounded much more. And this passage that I will probably quote every week for the next year anyway. Romans 8, verse 37 to 39. Yet in all these things were more than conquerors. You understand that's impossible, right? Conquering in itself is conquering. But somehow it's even more than conquering. Through him who loved us. Ah, we are more than conquerors if we can start living a more obedient, holy, righteous life. Boy, if the Bible said that, I'm in trouble. You're more than conquerors as long as you don't take of the fruit of the tree I told you not to take of. No, we are more than conquerors because of Jesus' love for us. Because of God, the Father's love for us. God so loved the world, we will conquer. We will not perish. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. We will conquer. We will not perish. We will conquer. We have eternal life. For I am persuaded in neither death nor what? Life. Ah, I guess I didn't need to die the same night I got born again. I guess a week after being a Christian is not dangerous for me. Being a struggling Christian for the last 30 years isn't overwhelming to God's grace, isn't tempting God's impatience with me. The life of a born-again believer is not in peril. We're more than conquerors. Even if we're alive and sinning, and when our sin abounds, his grace abounds more. Angels, principalities, or powers, all the demonic hosts, all the angelic hosts, Things present, nor what? Things to come. And that's the thing I'm really worried about it, is next year. It seems like I'm struggling more in this last year than I've ever struggled with sin. I hope the Lord takes me away quickly before I end up making a bigger mess of it next year. No, we're not worried about things to come either because we're being held by Christ's love nor height, nor depth. Boy, that's the thing I'm worried about is depths. Nor any created thing, human, earthly, supernatural, and the heavenlies, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we understand this knowledge of our salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. For some of us, it's been clear. It's just healing salve. The Lord anointing us with oil, putting the oil on the sheep. For some of us, it's getting clear. It's like preach another sermon on that, Brian. Keep sharing those same verses over and over again till I get all of that bad doctrine out of my heart, till I get all of that, that teaching of worry and fear and, and anxiety and doubt, get it from me so I can have the grace and peace reigning in my soul. But I want to say this, most people in the world do not know what you know about Jesus and the salvation and the forgiveness of sins. So let us go into the world and share the best news that has ever been said or ever will be said. We're not sufficient that anybody would come to Christ. Not a lot of words not a persuasive argument. None of us can lead another person to Christ. But all of us can be vessels that God can use. 
Isaiah says the word of goes out, word of God goes out and never returns void. It'll always accomplish that which it was sent out to do. Good friend of mine, Peter Barnes, he was a Jehovah Witness for 35 years. He was the number one Jehovah Witness in England, the top of the pyramid, and they sent him to America to be one of the top guys of the Watchtower Society in the United States, and they put him over the Southern California region. We're talking a guy that was a major Jehovah Witness. I got to know him well. But he said, in my 35 years of Jehovah Witness, I estimate I've been to over 70,000 homes. In those 35 years, in those 70,000 homes, five times, somebody said, I'm not a Jehovah Witness, nor will I be a Jehovah Witness, because what you're believing is a lie. Let me show you a verse. And they would show him a verse. And he would, of course, want to debate with them. And there's, nope, I'm not going to debate with you. That's all I know. God bless you. Bye. Those five times nagged him. He couldn't get it out of his head. He couldn't get it out of his heart. And when the Watchtower Society would come up with a different interpretation for the hard verses that disprove Jehovah's Witnesses. He goes, this is another thing that contradicts the last thing. And, and finally, those verses, God spoke to him and just said, read the New Testament. And he read the New Testament, became a believer, became an evangelist, a pastor. Guys, we have the most powerful thing that exists on this earth. It doesn't have to come from us. We just are presenters of it. But let me tell you what, God doesn't want you to take the riches of his grace and all the knowledge and wisdom of salvation and put it in a box and keep it at home. And then we get raptured to heaven and it's like, woohoo, I got my salvation. The Lord's going to say that wasn't for you to put it in a box, for it to be in your home only. It was for you to take a seed and scatter it in the world. I exhort you this week, write down one verse and write it down five times and give it to somebody every day this week. See what God might do. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word today and ask that it would go deep, deep, deep into our souls, into our hearts, into our minds. That we would be so deeply established in the truth that it's on our lips, it's in our heart, it's in our mind. We're walking with the joy that nothing separates us from the love of God. We're more than conquerors and this gospel is not for me only, but for everyone who will believe upon him. Help us, Lord. Baptize us in your spirit to be witnesses. And if you're here right now and you don't know the Lord or you're listening through streaming and you're not secure in your salvation, you should be. Just cry out to him with your heart. I believe that you, Jesus, are the way of salvation through your death and resurrection that I can be saved. And I trust in you. I want to follow you. I want to live for you. I'm yours. To those who believe upon him, he gives eternal life. And we thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen. Let's do it.